So thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here with you this evening for this amazing event. So as you heard in the introduction, I'm a naturopathic herbalist and these are some pictures of what I do. Herbal workshops, herbal walks and consultation. So I'm living in Moy, which is just in the edge of the Burren, and I spend a lot of time in the Burren, walking in the Burren, and just, just going to view the different plants there and to take photographs. I love to take photographs of herbs as they come out each season. So I'm going to do my top 10. It was really hard to choose them, but in this moment, my top 10 medicinal herbs in the Burren. So number 10 is honeysuckle. And when you're walking down the country roads on a really nice sunny day, a little gentle breeze, and you get that beautiful perfume, that aroma that's coming from the hedgerows, quite often that is this plant, honeysuckle. So it, it's probably its strongest feature is its beautiful smell. But also this flower would be really good for coughs, colds, sore throats, tonsillitis, flus. And it's got a substance in it called mucilage and lots of herbs that would contain mucilage. It's a very soothing. It's like a gel. It's like an anti-inflammatory gel that coats itself to the, it, it adheres, it sticks onto the mucous membranes of the body and it's got an anti-inflammatory effect and it's very soothing and healing. So this flower I love to use as a honey. So what I do is I put the flower heads and I get a nice jar of local of possible honey and I just submerge the flower heads in it and I leave them for a period of time. Usually I find a week is about enough and I strain it and you have this delicious honey that is really good for soothing the throat and to take for colds and flu. And you can see over there on the right, these were hedgerow drinks that I made. And the one at the back is honeysuckle. And they're basically made the same as elderflowers, like a fizzy drink. And the honeysuckle is just beautiful because you've got that beautiful, sweet aroma and it's just so, so tasty. So that's honeysuckle. Number nine is purple loose stripe. This one comes out a bit later. It's usually late June, July. You'll often see it in the hedgerows alongside Meadowsweet. And this one I love because it's really, it's not a herb that people refer to that often. And it's not one that I would have learned during my training. But it's a really valuable herb for the digestive system. And it's got Two, it's got a thing called tannins in it. So tannins would be a phytochemical, a plant chemical that are really good for tightening and toning the tissue. So that means if you get a cut, for example, and when you have a plant with tannins, when it tightens and tones the tissue, it means that it will help, it will knit the skin together. So it'd be a really good wound healer. So this would be an old wound healing herb. And that same wound healing capacity also works the same on the inside of the body. So you've got your digestive system running all the way down. And that also is like an inner skin. So when you drink a cup of tea, say of purple loose drive, and if you've got any inflammation, any rawness, any ulcers, the same way as it will help to knit together the outside skin. It will do the same on the inside. And the other thing it contains, like the honeysuckle, is mucilage. So it's also got that anti-inflammatory, soothing, gel-like substance. And the, these two things go together really, really well when people have things like gastritis, ulcers, or any kind of inflammation, colitis. And in some research has been done into purple loose strife only in the last couple of years. And it's found that it's also very effective against strains of bacteria and fungus. 
including Staphylococcus aureus, E. coli, H. pylori, and Candida albicans. So be good antibacterial and antifungal. That's also very useful in the digestive tract. The next one is red clover. This is a beautiful, soft, gentle herb. It's one that I would quite often give to children. So it would be very good for coughs. And it also has a little bit of sweetness. A lot of people would have sucked the red clover flowers as children, sucked the nectar out of them. So it's lovely, you know, as a tea or also as a honey are also made into a vinegar and it'd be great for cuffs for children and also for skin complaints. So it'd be good for eczema, psoriasis, acne. And years ago in Ireland, they often made a balm out of it and they would have used it a lot for psoriasis. And some older people in the community have spoken to me about, this is what they used to use for their psoriasis. This is what they remember as children. Oh, this is very plentiful. The next one, number seven, is Hawthorn. This is out at the moment. It's looking beautiful. A lot of those white showers of flowers that you see on the roadside are the Hawthorn tree. And Hawthorn has a very good reputation for the heart. It's been used for a long time for the heart. And most people would be aware of the berries, the red berries, the heart, but the flowers are also used for the heart and the leaves as well. And not only the heart, but the hawthorn would be really good for the circulation. And it, it, it's really good when people have say those little broken blood vessels, the capillaries, because it contains a substance called rutin that would be very good for strengthening the blood vessel walls. So it's like a tonic for the heart. It's really good for the circulation, but also for the integrity of the blood vessel walls. So it can be used in, you know, for varicose veins and anything to do with the blood vessels, as well as the heart and circulatory system. So if somebody say has poor circulation, you know, the hawthorn looks after, you know, the blood vessel walls, and then you might, give them something like ginger, which is warming, which the heat will also draw the circulation out into the periphery of the body. My next one is Eyebright. Now this is a really beautiful herb, it's very small. It's a semi-parasitic plant. So it will grow often on the roots of various species of grass and also on red clover and some plantains, some of the plantains. And Eyebright um, is given away in the name of it. It's a well-known remedy for the eyes. So anything to do with the eyes, eyesight, inflamed eyes, a really good way to use it would be, you know, like a tea bag with the, the Eyebright in it and putting it on the eyes, it'll just take down any inflammation on the eyes. And it's also one of the herbs that I would use for all this sinus congestion. So it's like a natural antihistamine. It helps to clear out the airways. So that would be eyebrows, plantain, nettle. It would be all, elderflower would be another one. And hay fever. So this would be the time now people would be getting hay fever. So this would also be a great herb to use for hay fever. Number seven, now well, this is wild thyme. I love the wild thyme, I love the color of it. I love the way it um, borders itself around the rocks. And wild thyme can be used very similar to culinary thyme. So wild thyme, you know, it's got that aroma. When you come across herbs like thyme, chamomile, mint, oregano, they all have this lovely aroma from them. So that aroma is down to a plant chemical called volatile oils. They contain volatile oils. And when a herb makes volatile oils, it will make them because 
It's a way to keep off any fungus or bacteria or viruses that might attack the plant. So it's like a survival strategy. So as the plant needs to create these, as, as the plant comes in contact with other microbes that are threatening to it, it will start to create these volatile oils. And these antimicrobial properties of the volatile oils transfer into us. So we get antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal. And another purpose of the volatile oils would be to attract pollinators to the plant. So it's the aroma goes out. So all these volatile oils, all these plants that have this beautiful aroma bring to us antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral properties that help us when we get infections. Another um, action of wild thyme would be that it's an expectorant, which means that it helps to clear the lungs of mucus. So it's a great herb to use for coughs. And it's one as well that is really tolerable by children. And it's also great for the digestive tract. It's a carminative, which means that it helps to move food, uh, helps you to digest food and absorb your food. And it relaxes the, the intestinal tract and just helps everything to move through much more smoothly. Number four is valerian. This is a plant I love to photograph with bees on it because they seem to spend a long time on it. So I always get really good photographs. It's a really well-known herb for sleep and it's the root that's used, but it's also good for relaxing the system in general and it's good for digestion, rela relaxing the digestive tract. So this would be quite a well-known herb and there's a lot of it in our hedgerows. Now oh, here's St. John's work. And it's just, the flowers are just beautiful. There's just this lightness about them. And that would be the thing about St. John's Worth and the herbal world, we think of it that, you know, that the flowers, it's like they absorb the sun and they can be, they bring into the body that lightness and that, that sunshine. And St. John's Worth would be a great herb to, to use for seasonal affective disorder, just for those blues when the mood goes down a little bit would have a very good reputation for that. But it's also a great antiviral, can be used for colds and flus. It's great for the nerves. It's great for sciatica. It makes a beautiful balm that can be used for cuts and burns and all sorts of first aid stuff on the skin. You have to be careful taking it internally because it does clear some certain medications out of the body quicker than normal. So it's not a herb that you take internally without advice, but you can most definitely pick the flowers and make a balm for the skin. And here we have yarrow. Yarrow is just an amazing plant. The name comes from the legendary Achilles, who used yarrow as a field dressing for his soldiers' wounds in the Trojan War. So again, this is a really, really good wound healer. Great for nosebleeds, great for cuts, great as a balm. It's also really good for colds and fevers. It helps the body to sweat out a cold, to throw off the fever, to bring the, the temperature down. And it's also very good for the circulation. It's great for the circulation of the pelvic area, great for women's complaints, and it's good for digestion. It's just an all round really, really powerful herb. And we come to our last one is meadowsweet. So this is queen of the meadow. And this photograph, the first one there is taken down in Karen. And you can see this quite a lot around the borough where you just have a whole field just full, packed full of meadowsweet. And this is a beautiful plant for digestion. It's really good for excess acidity in the digestive tract. It's really good for ulcers, gastritis. It's got those great tannins in it that really help to 
heal, heal the mucous membranes, but also just to clear up that excess acidity. And it also is, it, it has good action against H. pylori, which is the bacteria often associated with ulcers. And the other thing for Meadowsweet, it contains salicylic acid, which would be a, you know, in a very mild form, it would be the plant form of aspirin, the natural form of aspirin. So it does contain that. So it's got a mild form of pain relief and it's anti-inflammatory and it's great for the joints. So this is lovely made into a vinegar because a good apple cider vinegar is very alkalizing, which is also good for joint issues. But if you infuse the Meadowsweet in the apple cider vinegar, you've got a really good joint tonic for sore and inflamed joints. So I see I'm just over time. So I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope you like the photographs. And if there's a couple of quick questions, I'll hang around at the end and I can answer them in the chat. And thank you for coming. And I'll hand you over to our very capable great, great. Brendan. Thanks a million, uh, Lisa. That that was just fascinating. And I think, you know, a lot of very familiar flowers, um, but maybe just another way of looking at them and, and another layer to their um, kind of interest, which was lovely to see. There are a few questions there in the, in the Q&A. So if you, if you do get a chance maybe to, to send an answer through, um, that would be great. Um, and just, I suppose, to, to really thank you for your time and for sharing that knowledge with us. We really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to mention to people that we have over 205 participants. So hello to everybody who has signed in. I think the, fur the furthest away maybe I saw was Boston or North Carolina. And then we've lots of very local, but spread out around Ireland as well. I saw Belfast and Kells and, and different places like that mentioned. So great to have you all with us. And um, we've just jumped to 205 participants. So people are still signing in. It's great to see. Um, but we're going to move on to our next speaker. Um, and we're absolutely delighted to have uh, Brendan Sayers with us uh, this evening. Many of you are probably familiar with Brendan's work. Um, he has works at the, the Botanic Gardens in Dublin and has really dedicated his lifetime to the study, cultivation and conservation of orchids, both Irish and tropical. Uh, he was awarded the RHS Westenbert Orchid Medal in 2017, which is a medal awarded annually to an individual for any scientific, literary or other outstanding achievement in connection with orchids. So we're definitely in good hands. And I think people will probably know Brendan from the many amazing books that he has written um, in collaboration with the artist Susan Sex. So I'm going to hand you over uh, to Brendan and really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And as Pranjali said, to hearing that this, the uh, source for that intriguing title which I don't think we got any guesses on but um, I think you're you're going to share with us anyway where it has come from so thank you very much Brendan. Oh bear with me for one moment I hope you can hear me. We can. Hello. Very good. I will start to share my screen now and no um, you see I'm very very good with all my technologies here so, uh, don't worry. Can, we've all been on this uh, Zoom. Can, can you see world. my? Can you see my screen now? No, um, we're we're not seeing it just yet. Okay. Uh, this is all part of the the joys of Zoom. I think the did they reckon the most used phrases of the year would be "Can you see my screen?" and "You're on mute." Oh, we're we're seeing you now, Brendan. Your your screen is. Excellent. starting to make an appearance there yeah that's us we can we can spot it well, i'll leave it to um, you brendan very good good evening everyone and um thank you to burn uh and especially to pranjali and anya for inviting me um along um to give my presentation this evening and as anya alluded the title of my talk gems of the first water burn orchids is something that needs maybe a little explaining. Um, it's a borrowed title. It's a title that comes from a paper that was uh, written by Charles Nelson and titled Ad Gem of the First Water. And in that he was talking about Patrick Bernard Kelly, 
who eventually became P.B.O. Kelly. Um, he was born in 1852 and lived until 1937. And the house that he lived in and did business from uh, is Glenara House, and that's just south of Ballyvaughan. And he at one time referred to it as the Botanic Gardens and Fern Nurseries of Glenara House. Um, a picture on the left is a photograph taken and um, given by courtesy of Miss Teresa Andrucetti um, for the article that Charles wrote. And on the right hand of the screen, you will see a Chinese ink drawing done by the late Wendy Walsh, a botanical artist that worked uh, very much with Charles Nelson at the time. So the original use of gems of the first water were diamonds that were um, of the purest quality. Um, so for me, when I go to the Burren, um, the diamonds of the Burren and the gems of the pure water are indeed the orchids. So if we first maybe have a little bit of botany, and hopefully I won't um, bore you too much with it, um, we will look at what orchids are, and really they are probably 11% of all of the flowering plants on the planet. Um, over time, over 30,000 species have been described. And today, as um, botanists try to clean down the amount of duplicate names that have been generated over time, uh, on today's accessed list, there's 27,801 orchids um, listed on the planet. However, there are new species described weekly, and most of them are coming from the very um, poorly explored tropics where there's great um, biodiversity. Um, some orchid genera of the tropics that I would be familiar with working with are um, vanilla, um, that is one that we all know, but maybe don't know that we know. But uh, if you have a really good quality vanilla ice cream and you see those little black dots in it, that is um, from the seed pod of uh, the one best orchid that is known for um, you know, being useful to man for food. So a very, very simple um, composition of the orchid flower is that there are three sepals, three petals, um, two of them lateral petals, and the other is a modified petal um, referred to as the lip or la the labellum. And then the sexual parts of the flower um, are held together in a column. And then there is the ovary and the pedicel. So it's not a very you know, confused and elaborate um, floral combination. Quite, quite simple to understand once you get used to it. Some of the specific traits of the flower are that the pollen grains are often collected into either grainy masses or indeed into very, very tightly structured balls. And these are presented on little stalks attached to a very sticky pad. And uh, these are referred to as uh, collectively a pollinarium or individually as a pollinia. And on the left-hand side, you'll see the pollinia of the common spotted orchid. And then just against a 10 cent euro coin, you see four little uh, pollinia of the early purple orchid. And a lot of our Irish orchids hold these uh, pollinia in little purses or little versicles, um, keeping them protected from the weather until uh, the pollinating insect comes along and takes them away. Another adaptation of pollinia is that when it is taken away by a pollinating insect, it has a time period in which it bends. And this bending allows it to be in a position where it will be in the correct position to be picked up by the next flower. Um, however, in the time that it takes for that bending to take place, usually the pollinating insect has moved on to another flower um, of another plant of the same species, and therefore cross-pollination is affected 
and that makes for uh, the mixing of uh, genetic diversity. So you see on the bottom left, the early purple orchid, the bending takes between 30 and 40 seconds. However, visits to an individual flower uh, stem will only be about 10 seconds. And for the greater butterfly orchid, bending again, 80 seconds, but less than 80 seconds for a visit to a flowering plant. The underground parts of the orchid that we often don't see um, on the left hand side, the palm or finger like tuberoids of the um, a common spotted orchid and uh, any of the early marsh orchids the same. In the center, you have the rhizome of uh, a hellebarine. Um, on the bottom right hand side, you have the circular tuber of a bee orchid. And it is from here that the word orcus comes from or orchid comes from. And that is in allusion to the similarity between the shape of this circular tuber and a, a male testicle. And that is where when the Greek were naming these plants, it was thought that orchids only grew where the semen of satyrs had fallen and, and hit the ground. And just in the top right hand corner, then you have the only Irish orchid that has a pseudobulb, which we're much more familiar with in tropical orchids, and that is um, of the bog orchid, Amarbia paludosa. Another specific feature is the tiny seeds. On the left hand side, you can see some um, seeds in their little kind of uh, net like purses. And on the right hand side, a mycorrhizal fungus. And these are microscopic fungi that are absolutely necessary for the germination of orchid seed. So unless you have a habitat where the invisible fungi are happy and thriving, you will not be able to have the germination of orchid seed. So good habitat, which is found very, very much so in the burn, is obviously um, an absolute necessity. Again, pollination, which is probably the aspect of most of the orchid tails, um, is the most, the most fascinating part, really, of, of, of the orchid life. Um, on the left-hand side, you see Anglicum sequipali, uh, referred to as the, commonly as the comet orchid, uh, sometimes as Darwin's orchid, um, or the Star of Bethlehem orchid. And it is found on the island of Madagascar. And when Charles Darwin was writing about the pollination um, of orchids and trying to, you know, put forward his theory of evolution, he was given press specimens of this orchid from Madagascar. And because of the color and shape of the flower, he predicted that the pollinator was a moth, a night flying moth that had enough uh, and length in the tongue to access the nectar in this very, very long uh, nectary that you can see trailing from the back of the lip of the flower. And in doing so, he predicted the presence of that moth. And it wasn't until um, the 1990s that that uh, actual visiting of that moth to the um, flower was actually filmed. So about 130 years after he predicted this, it was actually captured for us to be able to see it um, in, in film. That story even goes further when you look at the work that has been done today um, out of some of the, the um, work done out of uh, Peter Maritzburg and the University of Peter Maritzburg in South Africa. And this is where you have a single species of bee being able to pollinate um, two different species of pterygodium, uh, a ground orchid found there. And in one species, it puts its pollen onto the long hands of um, the long handed bee and the other orchid species puts it on its bum. So they have this perfectly good um, position specific pollination mechanisms. So hopefully that's a lot of the heavy stuff um, gotten over with. Um, if we look a little at the 
all Ireland, um, both the Republic of Ireland and, and, and Northern Ireland, versus the Burren um, orchid count, you will see that all, all, all over the island we have 31 species. And however, the Burren, 27. And so this makes the Burren a huge attraction for people interested in Irish orchids. On the right hand side, you see uh, Paddy Riley's uh, flora of County Cavan listing only 17 species, Paul Green's flora of County Waterford 21 species, and indeed the flora of County Limerick, um, neighbouring County Clare, um, Sylvia Reynolds has recorded 20 species. So 20, or, uh, 27 species for the burn is very notable. There are two caveats in there. One is for Anacanthus Mario, um, there's, it is not a recent record, and the one for the bog orchid, Hamarbaya paludosa, it's an 1866 record, so quite some time ago. So we'll get into the orchids, and um, the first genus, and when I say genus, it means the first name of the species name, which is made up of two words. So Anacanthus is the first genus we look at, and it is the pyramidal orchid. Um, I like to look at this as one of our orchids that is classed as a common wildflower. Um, it is found in a variety of habitats from coastal dune lands up into upland pastures. Um, very common where it is, um, often found in the tens of thousands and uh, quite quite a common orchid, so a good, a good Irish wildflower. It is also uh, slightly deceiving in its common name. It's referred to as the pyramidal orchid, but it is only in its opening stage as a young flower that it has that pyramidal um, you know, silhouette. And you can see that in the center uh, picture there. Uh, on the left-hand side, you will see in the close-up that there are two raised ridges at the back of the base of the labellum or the lip. And that is, those ridges actually guide the proboscis of a pollinating moth into um, the nectary at the back, which is uh, a, a, a deceitful nectary. It is a nectary that doesn't have any nectar in it. So it is a, a, an orchid that is pollinated by deceit. Flower color in orchids is also not necessarily very stable. And in most species, you will find albinos. So on the right-hand side, you will see a completely white um, example of the pyramidal orchid, which is usually found in um, shades of between red and uh, pink and magenta. The next Anacanthus is Anacanthus morio, looking very, very different from its previous sister species. Um, and this is the green veined orchid. It is for a long time would have been classed in the genus Orcus um, because it is very similar to the early purple orchid in its structure. However, the fact that these two species that belong in different genera look the same is really because orchid species evolve to, you know, have a structure that pleases their pollinator as opposed to show an affinity as to where they came from in a direct lineage. So this is something that um, is difficult for some of maybe the older people who would have been looking at orchids over many decades to come to terms with where our investigations have allowed us to have a clearer understanding of what really is there and not necessarily what is visually put on front of us. We then move on to some of the Helleberines. Um, and even though we have two genera um, referred to commonly as Helleberines, this one is the sword-leafed or narrow-leafed hellebrine, and it is Cephalanthra longifolia. It is one of our very rare Irish orchids, and it is on our flora protection order. It is currently in flower. Um, I have had reports 
from uh, Galway population um, recently by uh, some of my um, reporters, uh, Jackie O'Connell and John Fogarty, have recently been telling me um, how it is doing at that um, current site. A close up uh, on the right will show you the flower that doesn't open very, very widely. Um, so it's quite um, kind of demure in its, in its presentation. However, on the left hand side, you can see that when it does grow in its preferred condition, and that is where it would have um, growing, say, at the edge of a forest, it can produce really nice, robust um, clumps of plants. We then will move on to the genus Dactylorhiza. Um, this is the most represented and probably the most confusing for people who are trying to get a handle on orchids. Um, but hopefully we will get through it fairly easy. Um, you can see there's the frog orchid and um, this is Dactylorhiza viridis and used to be um, in the genus Coeloglossum. Um, so some, uh, some old, older books will have that in it. Uh, maybe some more modern books still use that um, genus. Then we have the spotted orchids. We have the common spotted and the heat spotted orchid. And then amongst the marsh orchids, we have the early, the western, the narrow leafed marsh orchid, and the northern marsh orchid. So in the burren, the northern marsh orchid is not present. And for tonight's presentation, I don't have an image of the narrow leafed marsh orchid. Um, and that is my fault and not because I don't, um, I haven't been given enough slides over the time um, to actually put one in, but um, I didn't uh, get to finding it in time. So here we have the frog orchid, Dactylorhiza viridis. Uh, a very difficult plant to find in the field because on the left hand side there you see an example of what it looks like when you're trying to find it. Uh, again on the right hand side a similar type of, of uh, image. In the center a uh, little more close up. Uh, hard to know why it got the common name the frog orchid. Um, I don't know whether it's just that kind of toady looking head with the way the sepals and, and petals collect together. But um, <clears throat> these examples are very green in color. And in some uh, situations and some populations, you'll find quite a lot of red pigment in the flowers. So it's not always this, this pale. However, whether it's pale or whether it's highly pigmented, it usually is very difficult to find in the field. On to the spotted orchids. On the left hand side, um, we have the common spotted orchid. Again, a very, very common uh, wildflower and very, very common wildflower in the burren. Um, it is normally a plant that would be found only in calcareous areas where we have limestone. Um, however, in the burren, it's, it grows quite happily side by side with its sister species, the heath spotted orchid which will grow in the acidic uh, leached soils overlying the limestone in the burn. So um, the fact that they also hybridize um, makes it very difficult to look at certain populations with full confidence when you're looking at given a determination and uh, an identification of what you're looking at, especially in the burn. Telltale traits, for identification are the common spotted orchid on the left hand side, the central lobe of the lip extends below the side lobes of the lip. Whereas in the heath spotted orchid, you will see that the central lobe is actually not more extended than the side lobes. So that's a, a good identifying uh, feature between, between the two of them. Then within the common spotted orchid, there is a variety called Var ochellii. 
and we now go back to P.B. O'Kelly. Um, and it was he who first found this variety and sent it to Oxford, um, to a professor there. And it was called Var Immaculata, the immaculated variety, or the immaculate variety of the common spotted orchid. It is an entity that cannot be distinguished at a genetic level. So if you sequence this, or, or a botanist or scientist sequence it in a lab, it will show no difference in its genetic makeup than the ordinary common spotted orchid. However, in the burren, it is identifiable. Um, the flower on the right hand side will show you a, quite a broad um, flower. Um, usually pure white or with a little tinge of pink. It often has a slightly flat head to the flower and flowers a little later than most common spotted orchids in the burren. Um, it doesn't have any spotting on the leaf and sometimes has a slightly bluish sheen to the leaf. So an interesting entity best seen when you look at a, a small group of orchids, maybe slightly scattered, but they are all of this sort of, of uh, habit. And that is O'Kelly's variety of the common spotted orchid. We then move on to the Western or the Irish marsh orchid. And this is Dactylorhiza cariensis, or um, you will also see it as Dactylorhiza occidentalis, the Western marsh orchid. Um, it is an orchid whose name has been disputed, um, uh, but it has been disputed at the court of uh, botanical nomenclature. So um, it has been adjudicated on and the correct and accepted um, scientific name is Dactylorhiza cariensis. And that is because it was identified first in Kerry. Dactylorhiza incarnata, our early marsh orchid, is a very intriguing group of orchids, uh, a fantastic species to look at in, in which it presents itself. It is an example of a species that is very much active in using epigenetics and how it switches on and off genes. Um, so again, when this is sequenced, all the various varieties are sequenced, they show no difference in the genetic sequence. However, uh, the individuals present themselves very differently. So on the left-hand side, you will see what's called the soft baby pink of the nominate race um, found throughout Ireland. The central is an albino, um, so just presenting as a lovely white flower. And on the right hand side, you see this kind of brick red, which is usually found to um, see in dune slacks, uh, those hollows, those damp and, and sometimes submerged hollows between dune systems. In the burren, you will find uh, the homeland of the flecked marsh orchid. This is uh, the var variety uh, cruenta of the early marsh orchid, uh, found in very specific areas of the burren and also found in County Galway, but only restricted to those two counties in Ireland. And also then over in the West, you find this very elegant form of the early marsh orchid, uh, Dactylorhiza incarnata varpulkella, uh, where the flowering stem is stained a deep purple. Uh, so all of those last five examples are different ways in which the early marsh orchid presents itself. So um, quite, a, quite a, a disguised species in, in, in how it goes about its job. The next genus is Epipactus, and again, commonly referred to as Hellebrines. And earlier we saw uh, the, the sword-leafed 
Hellebrine, whereas now we're into a new genus, but again, Hellebrine is used as the common name. The marsh Hellebrine uh, is Epipactus palustris. Uh, a view on the right just shows it in habitat. On the left-hand side, you'll see the very, very fringed uh, section of the lip. And this is a hinged lip, so that when the pollinating uh, insect comes to visit, it lands on this frilled white piece at the front, and it then weighs it down. Uh, it then, as it goes to leave the flower, the hinge sends the pollinating insect into an upward motion, hitting the pollen and taking it away and therefore uh, enabling it to cross pollinate as it, as it goes about its business. Here is a, a picture of uh, where orchids can confuse each other. And this is where the more prominent uh, fragrant orchids are seen grown alongside um, the marsh hellebrine. Epipactus hellebrine, the common hellebrine, is found throughout the burn. Um, it can be found in hazel scrub, in woodland, and also out in the open amongst the um, uh, limestone. Uh, it is a species of hellebrine that is uh, an outcrossing hellebrine. So it does like to send its pollen um, out from one plant to another plant whereas certain hellebrines in Ireland um, don't like to do that. They prefer to actually self-pollinate. Um, and for anybody looking for uh, a good botanical tip, the bottom flower on the central image shows a clear, quite circular um, point in just above the, the lip of the flower. And that is the basidium which shows that um, this is an outcrossing species and the, the, the self-pollinating species of Hellebrine don't have that basidium. Uh, it disintegrates and uh, they self-pollinate. And here again, another great joy of the burn, the dark red Hellebrine, Epipactus atrorubens. And this is one of the flowers of the burn that will attract people later in the season because it is uh, July and August when you'll find this in flower. And um, it is one of the, the great joys of the burn in, in, in the late season. Usually found in this um, very deep red color, but also some peach and apricot um, variants can be found um, if, you, if you do enough walking around and looking about. The next group are our fragrant orchids. Um, this is Gymnodenia. Um, there are three species found in Ireland and their traits within the flowers aren't um, very clear in, in uh, being able to dis distinguish them. So therefore habitat is one of the ways in which you can distinguish them. However, in the burren, where you have acid and limestone loving species growing side by side, that becomes even more difficult. Um, on the left hand side, we have the dense flowered fragrant orchid. Um, so this is Gymnodenia densiflora. On the right, the common fragrant orchid, again, an albino example of uh, the, the species. And here from Ireland's Wild Orchids at the hand of the botanical artist that I have worked um, most of my life with, um, and that is Susan Sex. You can see the three, what at the time were considered varieties of the uh, fragrant orchids illustrated. Uh, the central is the dense flowered, which has quite a large and, and kind of flowery labellum or lip to the flower. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see Gymnodenia canopsia, the kind of common fragrant orchid. And on the right-hand side, you see the heat-spotted orchid. 
Uh, again, that's one that would be found in acidic conditions and is best identified outside of the burn where you have pure acid um, conditions, or if in the burn, if you found it on some cutaway bog, um, you would be able to identify that clearly, but they still are quite difficult to, to identify where they grow side by side. And another image of the dense flowered orchid and also uh, looking at some of the pollinators. And here you have the six spot burnet moth um, removing pollen from uh, a fragrant orchid. And on the right hand side, if you look at the proboscis or the tongue of the, the moth, you will see the yellow uh, pollinia attached to that tongue. We then move on to another one of our very rare Irish orchids and one that is dubiously uh, placed in the burn um, in the year 2021, seeing that the last time it was recorded was 1866. So this is a very, very tiny orchid. It is a very difficult orchid to find. Um, it usually grows in sphagnum hummocks and uh, little runnels of, uh, you know, run, runoffs of, of peat bogs. Uh, it is very successful where it does grow, but is uh, probably under-recorded in Ireland and another uh, of our flora protection order species. It is the only Irish orchid, as I mentioned earlier, to have a pseudobulb, and it also produces tiny little bulbils on the edge of its leaf. And you see on the left hand image, that little cluster of bulbils, and they will eventually fall off the leaf and grow into new plants um, as they move along, along the runnel that they're growing in. Neotinia, um, the dense flowered orchid, or indeed the Irish orchid, um, is a species of orchid that was found in Castle Taylor in County Galway in um, 1894 and caused quite a stir when it was found because it's an orchid that is found more often in the Mediterranean than it is found in Britain or Ireland. So uh, this was quite a find and is an example of um, the Mediterranean flora that uh, you know, where you have plants that are found in the burren and not necessarily have an eastwardly distribution, but more a southeasterly distribution, uh, showing that uh, there probably was um, a land link between and um, the continent proper at the time that uh, allowed these plants to, to, to exist in Ireland today. In the burren, um, the dense flowered orchid is mainly seen as it is photographed on the right hand image. And this is where it is this lovely kind of pale ivory color. However, the variety on the left is what's referred to as var straminea. And this is that kind of uh, dirty little pink color. Um, and in the center is an indication as to the size of the, the, the whole plant in flower. And that's the Susan Sex's finger uh, showing, you know, the size of it. And often when, you know, a presentation like this is given um, where the orchid flowers are singled out, you get a false impression of how easy it might be to see these plants where really um, you can sometimes be looking for hours and uh, in recent years, I had to <clears throat> direct somebody to see this plant because they were coming to the burn for two days and uh, they, they needed to see it. And even following detailed instructions, um, they failed to find it, went back and repeated the instructions and eventually found it. So it is um, quite, quite a difficult one to find, but a great joy when you do find it. Uh, the next genus is Neotia. Um, the first is the common tway blade, again, very well named uh, because it is very common. 
um, throughout Ireland. Um, it is a species that doesn't have a flamboyant flower. Um, it's just yellow green in color, a little bit of red marking on it. But if you get up close to the flower, and especially if you have a magnifying glass with you, you'll see that in the center of the lip, there is a little channel of nectar that is running down the center. And this is what's attracting tiny little midges in. The midges, you know, walk their way up, sipping this nectar, eventually coming in contact with the, the pollen and taking it away to cross pollinate. And this is just a slide to show you that sometimes orchids get very happy where they're growing. And not only do they produce, uh, <clears throat> replicate, you know, one stem per year, but they will become quite happy to produce large clumps of, of, of uh, flowers. Then the lesser tway blade, uh, a very, very difficult plant to find because it is only a few centimeters tall and usually spends its time growing underneath heather. So if you want to try to find it, um, you need to walk up a hillside um, and as you walk up, lift the heather up with your arm and see if this plant is growing underneath it. However, fortunately for me, um, Claire Herdman um, just outside Glengareth had uh, cleared some rhododendron, invasive rhododendron ponticum, and this uh, orchid came up in its hundreds um, following the cleared rhododendron. So it was very um, easy to get into. Another species that is pollinated by um, fungal or, or fungus gnats and tiny flies, but again, very successfully because usually you will find all um, flowers produce uh, a seed pod. So quite, quite successful. The third species of Neotia is the bird's nest orchid. And this is one of our species that is um, saprophytic. So it doesn't have any chlorophyll. It lives its uh, life completely um, uh, in conjunction with a symbiotic fungus and uh, doesn't uh, need any chlorophyll um, for itself. So the only time you will see this plant when it is above ground flowering, the rest of the time it's living quite happily underneath the ground um, in conjunction with um, its mycorrhizal fungi. And sometimes when it's very happy, it does that. The next is the bee orchid. On the right hand side, you can see um, a typical bee orchid. On the left hand side, you see a distribution map of the genus Ophrys. And this shows you that our bee orchids are very much on the edge of their territory. And so much so that you see that um, bee orchids in Scotland um, are almost absent and so rare in Northern Ireland that it is a species that is um, on their uh, flora protection order, the uh, uh, Northern Ireland uh, protection order or for, for flora. Um, so highly protected up there can be very, very common down here. Again, it is one that produces great variation. On the left-hand side, you have a variety that's referred to as varflavescens. And this is a photograph from Zoe Devlin. And Zoe has photographed that in the burn. On the right-hand side, you see another variety um, that is not being recorded from the burn. That's the Florantha, but I use it to show you that this is a species that even though it is structured to be pollinated by an insect because the flower mimics an insect and um, it no longer has that pollinator and has evolved to allow its uh, pollinia. And these are the yellow balls that are hanging um, 
you know, on, on those long stems. So they fall out of the purse that they were held on. And now they will be moved by the wind into the stigmatic surface and pollination will affect. Um, this allows these specific traits to remain constant. So wherever you do find this um, white and yellow form of the bee orchid, um, it will stay constant. The sister species is the fly orchid. And this is again, very, very difficult to find, but very common in the burn. And uh, you can see quite easily why it is referred to as the fly orchid. And this is the species that shows the true pollination mechanism of the genus, and that is pseudo copulation. So naive male wasps will emerge. Um, they will come emerge from the, the soil at a time when the bee or, or the fly orchid is in flower, and they will try to mate with it, thinking that it is a female of the species. Um, eventually, the females emerge and the male wasp will learn that uh, the difference between the flower and the, the female of the species and they no longer uh, will need to look at trying to mate with a flower. But in doing so for their practice runs, they do affect pollination. The genus Orcus, the early purple orchid is one of the great joys to see, especially in a year where, where, when it's prolific um, in the burn. And that is easily identified by its upward pointing stem and the fact that it doesn't have any green veins to its sepals. Um, it is a beautiful species, very, very diverse in its uh, presentation of colors. Here on the left-hand side, you just have a, a purple spotted white form, but on the right hand, um, a very, very good clump of uh, an albino. Um, not only is it white, but if you look at where the pollen would usually be, um, you can see that it's just, th there's no red pigment at all. So a true albino of the early purple orchid. Next on to the butterfly orchids and um, the butterfly, the greater butterfly and the lesser butterfly be quite similar in appearance. However, if you look closely at the way the pollinia are held in the top um, illustration, you will see that the pollinia are held in a roughly horseshoe shape. And in the bottom, the lesser butterfly the pollinia are held parallel. And that is the simple way that you can identify these two orchid species that are quite similar when you encounter them in the, in the field. We then move on to the small white orchid, Pseudorchis albida. Again, the left-hand photograph or will show you just how it would look in the field. So quite difficult to see. Um, and the illustration in the center will show you that its spur contains nectar. So it is a, a, a species that is giving a reward to a pollinator and not pollinating by deceit. So quite a nice um, species, a species more encountered in Ireland in our northern counties um, and yet at the same time suffered quite a bit from uh, farming improvements and probably now getting a, a greater hold again as we learn how to manage our lands better. We then moved to Spiranthes and Autumn Ladies Tresses. We have two, two species in Ireland, but only one of them found in the burn. Uh, this is a, well named again because we do found, find it in flower in the autumn time. If I am to name my favorite uh, native Irish orchid, I think I will always come up with this. Um, again, very, very uh, small when in flower, but 
when you do find it in the right place, you often will find it in flower in the thousands. So uh, on short grassland in dune systems or along some of the green roads in the burren, uh, that's where to look for it in the autumn time. And then <clears throat> amongst the orchids, we have hybrids. And this is where you have some of the dactyloriza, which are essentially quite promiscuous in um, how their pollen goes from species to species. Uh, and you are presented with plants that have traits of both parents. So on the left hand side, you have the Irish orchid crossed with the heat spotted orchid. And this was a photograph taken in a beautiful field uh, in Listun Varna. Uh, the central photograph is uh, a plant that doesn't have a botanical name, but it's the Irish orchid hybrid with the early marsh orchid. And I mentioned earlier about the common and the heat spotted orchids growing together. And this is the resulting hybrid um, Dactyliza transiens. You also have what are considered or were considered uh, bigeneric hybrids where two different genera cross over. So when the frog orchid was considered uh, to be a member of uh, Celoglossum, it would hybridize with the common spotted orchid and give you um, Celo or Dactyloglossum. Now that it is considered a Dactyloriza, the hybrid is only referred to as Dactyloriza um, cross mixtum. Whereas on the right hand side, you have a hybrid that is created by two genera uh, crossing over. So this is a fragrant orchid of the genus Gymnodenia crossed with the common spotted orchid of the genus Dactyloriza. So you're left with the hybrid genus X um, or cross Dactylodenia. And these have been recorded from the Burren. Um, they're rare. Um, but with a good uh, amount of observation, they should be found more regularly than they are. The photographs tonight, very few of them were mine. Um, any of them that you said, that's a really bad photograph, they were probably mine. Um, but most of the good ones are Jackie O'Connell, uh, Mary Horrigan, as I mentioned, Zoe um, during the talk. Vincent Sex has also done some scans for me. There's possibly a Paddy Tobin uh, photograph in there. And there may also be possibly a Robert Thompson photograph in there. Um, I didn't acknowledge them in words, but I will, or in, in text, but I will acknowledge them in words. And I can only say that there is a field guide to Irish orchids. It's called um, Ireland's Wild Orchids, a field guide. Um, it is authored by Brendan Sayers and illustrated by Susan Sex. Um, I highly recommend it. And I also would like to say thanks to Byrne Bio for inviting me to present this evening. And I hope you found some of it of interest. Oh, Brendan, that was just fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, it's made me feel much better about the struggles I often have identifying orchids around the Burren, but I can only echo that the recommendation for that book it's, it's really amazing um, and and I would recommend people to, to get a copy if they can I think we have probably um time for a question or two um and I I might kick off with one that probably it was something that was kind of came to mind for me as well as we were uh, as you were talking and it's a question from Paddy Tobin who you've mentioned and who I should also mention Paddy actually if there was a prize for identifying um, the uh, kind of inspiration for the title Paddy would be getting it because because he did in the chat and um, figure out where it had come from but unfortunately no prize tonight but um, he has a, a nice question there and about you know whether there's an explanation for the explosion of bee orchids on areas which were not where they were not previously previously present um, and he's obviously seen them in a covered landfill site and on the site of a demolished factory in Waterford and I suppose add on to that the kind of question I had was whether the orchids um, uh, ranges are spreading or is it still kind of you know are they being held in in areas where they were previously seen and only there are there any thoughts on that well 
the 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 main thing about bee orc has been found in great profusion there's probably a few different elements to why that's happening one i think is the fact that dereliction suits certain orchid species um, and especially where there is waste ground and low nutrient ground and that is where orchid species like bee orchids can seed into uh, they will find very little competition and therefore they can thrive uh, a lot of the waste sites also will have uh, the ability to heat up more. And this is something that would suit an orchid species like the bee orchid because their central, uh, central distribution is in areas like the Mediterranean where soils would dry out um, you know, quite brilliantly during the summer. So derelict sites will often do that, that as well. There is also an element where certain species will be quite you know abundant in in a year and may not be abundant in following years and the exact reason for that i can't actually say um, and I, I would imagine very few people can say you know exactly what it is the other element of patty's question is that yes there certainly is a change um one of Continental orchid species has now been found in England, and it is one that has been determined to have come of its own volition and not been, been brought in by, by humans. And I expect that we will find the same thing happening here in time, and we will find the range of orchids that are slightly restricted, say, to the south and west of the country will eventually move up more north, and that would be just uh, the, the result of, of climate change and more benign um, environment in, 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 you know, within the island itself. Great. Oh. And I just, I'm sorry, Brendan, there's just oh, one more maybe that seeing as we are online and um, I'm, I'm trying to see, can we recreate even slightly what Burn and Bloom might have been like if we were in person? There's a question here from Anne-Marie Keoghan, who presumably is visiting the Burren next week and has asked, what can we expect to see next week in the Burren? So maybe just, you know, if, if we were out on a walk um, at the moment, what, what, which of those species would, would you maybe expect to see? Um, and, and then I'll hand back to Pranjali, thanks. Well, you, you should be seeing um, the early purples should still be in flower. Um, if you are diligent and look closely enough, you may be lucky enough to see uh, the dense flowered orchid or the Irish orchid. And um, you can put whatever common name you, you, you wish on that one. Um, the, the Irish orchid is, is a, nice, a nice name, especially if you're visiting Ireland. Um, the, some of the dactylorhiza will be coming into flower, um, but it is a difficult year to predict because we have had such a cold spring. Um, what you would normally um, be predicting is going to be in flower, um, isn't. But at the same time, I can tell you that the uh, Irish orchid, the Irish marsh orchid or the Western marsh orchid um, is in flower because it's in flower in my mother's garden in Tralee so if it's in flower there and has been for a couple of weeks, I expect that it'll be flowering in the barn. Thank you very much, Brendan. I think, unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions. And there, there's, there is a good few, but hopefully um, if we get Brendan's book, that might answer some of them. Uh, this was a fantastic presentation, Brendan. You know, uh, in a, such a short space of time, you've really given us an encyclopedia of, uh, of barn orchids. And hopefully now we have a video resource of, of your talk. Uh, we will uh, upload a recording of this talk on our YouTube channel and hopefully people will benefit from revisiting this talk um, and help them identify orchids when they're out and about next. So Brendan, thank you again for your time today. Really appreciate it. And thanks also to our first speaker, Lisa Gain, uh, who who's, who's left, but thank, thanks to Lisa and Brendan both and thanks to all our attendees. Um, I will leave you now with our program for the last day of Born in Bloom, which is tomorrow evening. Um, if you can join us tomorrow evening at eight o'clock, we have two um, wonderful speakers again, um, and that will be the last evening of Born in Bloom, so don't miss it. You'll find the registration link um, on burninbloom.com. Uh, so with that, have a very good evening, and um, we'll see you soon.